It is a blessing that we are able to be together this morning and to worship and to praise God and grateful that we can have his word to understand the things that are necessary in order for us as his creation to glorify him and to praise him. The scripture that I'd like to begin the lesson can be found in Matthew chapter 26 and we'll be noting verses 36 through 37. And I appreciate Clint leading the song more about Jesus. And certainly the infinite mind of God has been revealed to us through his word. And we can clearly see the infinite nature of his son, Christ Jesus. And there's always more that we can learn about Christ. And I hope this morning as we consider these passages that we will have to look and turn and study together will help us to gain even more insight and learn more about Jesus. Beginning there in verse 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, O oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And so we understand the events that are taking place here. Christ had previously instituted the communion of his death, of his sacrifice on the cross, and of the great resurrection that we know is to forthcome. And as he is considering and, com and giving contemplation to the events that are before him, he is there in the garden praying. And we see the depth of the sorrow that is upon him, even distress to the point of death. So the text contains a very simple statement. And that simple statement is that Jesus went a little farther than the place where he left his disciples and he fell on his face and prayed. And so what I'd like for us to consider this morning are some of the characteristics, the nature of Jesus, learn more about Jesus and how much further he has gone than many of us. It is true that he went a little further in many other things, in his teaching, in the principles, in the life that he lived and demonstrated before us than those that were with him and for us to consider ourselves. So let us consider to what extent Jesus has gone farther. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning there in verse 38, you have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And then if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet one another, excuse me, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In the context of what we have read here, Christ is doing some comparatives for us. And we certainly can relate to the things that he is talking about in our present life and even the things that we have studied this morning, comparing the nature of this world and worldly wisdom and the humanistic thinking in contrast to the thinking of Christ 
and the ideas that he was bringing before them and not retaliating, not seeking your own vengeance. And as he even pointed out, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And they can understand how to love their neighbor, but inversely they concluded that if I love my neighbor, therefore I must hate my enemy. And he's breaking down all of these barriers of thinking that were pervasive among the Jews and among the world at that time, but certainly are evident to us even today. But he's wanting us to understand this divine nature and that we don't allow these things to consume our lives. We can spend virtually our entire lives trying to retaliate from those that bring evil and harsh treatment upon us. It's virtually every day throughout our days and, and many times. And certainly in the workplaces, the conflicts, the challenges, the barriers, the obstacles that you constantly have to manipulate through just to have people work together and be at peace with one another. And he is telling us here, be perfect, be complete as your heavenly father is complete or perfect, which we have as Christ, as our example. Jesus went a little further than we have gone. He went further in prayer and let us notice the nature of Christ in his prayer in a parallel passage in Luke chapter 22 and verse 39, as we had just read in Matthew. It says, Jesus went out as usual, excuse me, as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And angels from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Again, we see the nature of Christ here, his devotion, his deep felt anxiety in the events that were coming before him. And he went and he prayed. And it said that in his prayer, sweat as great drops of blood fell to the ground. So which of us, when we have prayed, have even broken out of sweat, even really dedicated ourselves in our minds to the events that have come to press upon us? Or do we even give consideration to prayer? As we will note further in some of the passages. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, one of those days Jesus went out of the mountain to pray and spent the night praying to God. Jesus went further. He has spent his entire night in prayer to God. As we know, interceding in prayer with the Father. Who among us have even continued to pray at all throughout the night or through the partial of the night or even as the night sets in at the end of our day? Do we even go to God in prayer, thanking him that he has blessed us with the life that we have just completed in the day that we lived, let alone continue in prayer throughout the night? In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Christ on the cross, as his life was being taken away from him, brought upon them this desire of God that they would not be held in first degree murder, but in ignorance that they did the things that they did. Who among us would be willing to forgive those who are murdering us? So do we give prayer our first consideration? Do we instantly go to prayer when problems come upon us? Or are we, as he described, seeking vengeance and retaliation and dealing with problems ourselves rather than as Christ modeled for us and is a pattern for us, and we learn more about him, take our cares, our concerns, our calculations, our deliberations in life, 
and lay them before God. Surely, Jesus went a little further than we do in prayer. I'd like for us to consider in sympathy the nature of Jesus. We express our sympathies. Jesus manifested his. In John chapter 11, beginning there in verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Jesus, in his sympathy, has gone farther than we can. He manifested his sympathy. And of course, once again, he was troubled by this, as it is described to us, deeply moved in his spirit. And then continuing with this, he wept with Mary and Martha, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 11, verse 21, moving further back, he said, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives, by believing in me, will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. How much greater is the sympathy of Christ and bringing to her this understanding and the understanding that she had in the resurrection of life and the power that Jesus possessed. Moving down to verse 38 of John 11. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he had been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came out to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Jesus manifested his sympathy for Mary in raising Lazarus from the dead. Certainly, Jesus possessed the power to go further. But for us, we need to think about that we are limited, but do we express the deep, heartfelt sympathy towards others that we can? Do we really strive to understand the grief, the sorrow, and the anguish of others? Or are we superficial? Do we really seek to have the sympathy after the order in the mind of Christ. As we understand, there will be a time when all the tears and the anguish of this life will be passed away, as we understand in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, that God will wipe away all tears from their eyes and shall be no more sorrow or, or crying, and there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And that is the hope that we have, but realizing this present life, it is full of sorrow. It is full of pain. It is full of anguish. We suffer losses. Do we have true sympathy one for another? 
And then we also know that Jesus was not limited in his expression, but we have been. But he also had compassion on the multitudes. And as we understand in Matthew chapter 14, noticing there at verse 15, an evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. Give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fishes, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Noticing again in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and having nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And he said, and they said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the multitude. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now, those who ate were 4,000 besides women and children. Christ demonstrated his compassion in great abundance, and the abundance to the extent of that which he describes here that they continued to, to gather. And so he, again, is not limited, was not limited in his compassion. So again, we ask ourselves, what compassion do I have? Do I turn people away? Do I recognize the needs that individuals have? And here we see this simply stated in these two passages that we have noted about the love and the compassion that Jesus had. And Jesus teaches us a principle. And that is, he realized that People really do not care what you know about the things you share with them until they really know your care for them. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Christ taught us that principle. And he cared for people. And they desired to learn. Do we practice that in our lives as well through compassion? to be influential upon others because the greatest thing, of course, is the salvation of the soul and how we might influence others to win them to Christ. He was moved with compassion to heal the sick in Matthew 14 and verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed the sick, demonstrating once again his love and his compassion. Surely Jesus went further in his empathy because he manifested it to others. And then we recognize the love that Christ had. And no greater love do we know than the love that Christ had. And Christ brought forth a new commandment that we learn how to love as he loved us. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. We have been cleansed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified, we have been made right with God when we enter into the waters of baptism and come into the contact with the blood of Christ, and he died for us. 
in Romans 6 and verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. The doctrine that Christ gave us through the salvation of his blood, in his love for us. We were slaves to sin, and he freed us through his love for us. In Acts 20 and verse 28, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The love of Christ in purchasing the church, purchasing us as his body of the saints. In John 3 and verse 16, a passage that Mike recently talked to us on Wednesday night, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God loved his son, and he gave his son for us, that we might be saved who believe in him and will not perish, but have everlasting life. And in this passage, he said he didn't send him into the world to condemn the world. Christ was not sent into this world to judge it, to pronounce sentence on mankind. God might have been able clearly and justified to have sent his son to do this. Man deserves condemnation and it would have been right to pronounce it upon us by Christ at that time. But God was willing that there should be a pardon offered for us. And the sentence of condemnation has been delayed because God would desire that we all become obedient unto the truth. But although Jesus did not come to, to condemn mankind, yet the time is coming when he will return and judge the living and the dead. In Acts chapter 17, noting there in verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. God would have us all be saved. He's given us this assurance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that we would be saved. In John 15 and verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus went a little further. Certainly, we have great love to lay down our life for our friends. Jesus went a little further. He laid down his life for his enemies. Noting in Romans 5, 6 through 10, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples." As the, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Christ died for us, giving us this hope, giving us these commandments, and for our lives, it is simply defined as being commandment keepers. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will avoid the second death. If you love me, heaven will be your future home. And you are assured of that. Surely Jesus went further in his love that he has manifested to us. Let's also notice about the nature of Christ in sacrifice. In John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the shepherd and flees. And the wolf catches the shepherd and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power again to take it again. Excuse me, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received of my Father. Christ came to fulfill the old law and to fulfill God's purpose, God's eternal purpose and plan, as we understand, before the very foundation of the world was to bring all things together within Christ Jesus, which in that required for him to become the sacrifice for all men for all times by giving his blood. And God was well pleased. God loved his son for his willingness to give himself. Christ is the good shepherd. He has given his life for his sheep. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. He came to do the will of the Father to fulfill this will that we might have eternal life. So let us consider then, men have sacrificed to achieve particular accomplishments. Men have sacrificed wealth, prestige, and even their lives. But Jesus went a little farther. He sacrificed the riches of glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Christ was with God in eternal heaven, the riches and the glory of heaven. He gave that up to come to this world to suffer and die for us and sacrifice for us. This does not compare to any sacrifice man could ever give for one another, for nations, for families, compared to this great sacrifice that Christ has given us. He did not lay aside wealth on this earth after he possessed it, for he had none. His wealth, his riches, and his glory were in heaven. In Philippians 2, verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. He didn't lay aside riches that he had amassed in his present life. He didn't have those riches. But what he did was he recognized God's eternal purpose and plan, and he took on the form of a bondservant, the likeness of man, appearing as man, and he was crucified on the cross. He was the creator of all things. We understand that in John 1 and verse 3, as again we have recently studied. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In Colossians 1 and verse 16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is 
before all things, and in him all things consist. As a creator, he had the right to all things and dominion of all things. He's the creator. He had the right to all things. He gave up wealth and riches that we cannot even begin to comprehend for our soul's salvation. Who can compare to the sacrifice that Christ gave for us? In Matthew 6 and verse 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where three thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So it was through his poverty that we might become rich. We consider the things of this life and, and various riches, and some things are more sure than others. But he's telling us of the sure thing, the sure riches, and the riches that are eternal. Those are not uncertain riches that we may obtain to, that of eternal life. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Can we now have a greater appreciation and learn more of Jesus and the sacrifice he made and the riches of his blood compared to the silver and gold and the things of this present life? compared to his eternal glory that he gave up for us, how does it compare? Men give little blood to save life. Christ went further. He gave all his blood to save the world. In Hebrews 9 and verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to, spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more, how much more can we learn about the great sacrifice of Christ? In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, as we had noted, who washed us, were regenerated from our sins through his blood. Men might give their life and blood for their family, for their nation, Christ gave for all men, all times, from the creation until the time that he comes to deliver the kingdom unto the Father. Surely Jesus has gone further in sacrifice. Let's notice how he has gone further in seeking and saving the lost. In Luke 19 and verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He came to save the lost that we all might have eternal life, that no man should perish. So we have preachers and evangelists that go into strange cities and strange countries to seek and save the lost. They risk their health, they risk their life, they risk their well-being, they risk their prosperity to go and seek and save the lost. But you know, Jesus went further. He went into a strange world to seek and save a loss. A world that despised him and hated him and crucified him, the very Son of God, the very creator of all things. We're instructed in Mark 16, 15 and 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In John chapter 17 and verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am and they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. Christ came to fulfill again God's purpose 
that we might be one, that we would have the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace in the kingdom that he had purchased with his own blood, and that we may be partakers of the eternal glory. So we find that as preachers go into this world, they find the same conditions wherever they go. There's war, there's conflict, there's sin, there's sorrow, there's suffering, there's death, there's revolt. Jesus left the perfect state to come and be with us. How much greater of a sacrifice in seeking and saving the loss has he has made? Jesus left a world where those things were not known to come to a world that is full of all the death and the decay and the sorrow and the suffering to seek and save the lost. In John 17 and verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with you with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Christ sacrificed all of this to save our souls. In John 17 and verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. You loved me before the foundation of the world. And we have insight into the eternal glory that is before us by being within his kingdom on this earth and the conditions that he wants to have prevailing within the church because he has given us insight into the glory of heaven and the things that he has given up. And certainly, Jesus has gone further in seeking and saving the lost. Let's notice in patience the nature of Christ and more about Jesus. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 20, he says, For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In this passage, the one particular point I would like to notice is Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. The example that we can learn more about Jesus, the example of how much further Jesus has gone than we have. And in this passage that Peter has written to us here, understanding the nature of this life versus that of the eternal life that is before us and the things that we patiently endure as we consider our soul's salvation and the inheritance of heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, noticing there verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Again, let's consider Jesus. Let's learn more about Jesus and how he handled hostility from sinners against himself. That we do not become discouraged because we have yet to resist against bloodshed, striving against sin. So brethren, we have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, but let's consider him who endured. Then noticing beginning there in Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. 
and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So he talks about endurance, or also patience, of the things that we have before us, running this Christian race, that we have an endurance before us, this journey that we have. And our eyes should be set as we are running this race on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For consider him. So what he is telling us here in the conclusion of this thought is rather than yielding to sin in any form, we are to resist sin in every form, resisting even unto blood. Resist sin. Give no place for sin. Let it not once be mentioned among us, as we had studied this morning. Surely Jesus went a little further in patience than we have gone. And let us consider in forgiving. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. We may reluctantly forgive our friends when they plead us to do so. Jesus went further, again, in forgiving his enemies, who were not seeking forgiveness from him. They weren't looking for forgiveness. They wanted to crucify him. Surely he went a little further in forgiving them when we recognize that he was facing death and crucifixion and forgiving what we have ever gone. In Romans 5 and verse 8, he says, but God demonstrated his love towards us and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we recognize this great love that Jesus had and this forgiveness that he demonstrated because he forgave us, came and justified us through his blood while we were enemies. And so what this verse describes to us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There are four things stated that we have received as a result of Christ dying for us in this passage. First of all, he says, being now justified by his blood, we have received justification through his blood. That we have been justified. We have been made right with God once again through the blood of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And as we previously noted, Christ didn't first come to condemn the world, to judge the world and pass judgment, but there is a time that he will come and he'll deliver the kingdom unto the Father and judgment will be pronounced upon all mankind. And thirdly, he stated, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of Christ. Reconcile means to change from enmity to friendship. So when we were enemies, God reconciled us through his son. And then fourthly, that we were enemies not only expresses man's hostility and attitude and intent to God, but signifies that until this change of mind takes place, men are under condemnation, exposed to God's wrath, the death of his son in the means of which we receive removal from the wrath of God. Thus, we have received reconciliation. In Romans 6 and verse 5, for if you have been united together in the likeness of death, 
certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We have been reconciled by Christ's death. We will be reconciled in like similitude in the resurrection according to the pattern that he has given us. We will be saved from wrath by his life. We have this resurrection of life that we can be partakers of. Surely Jesus has gone further in forgiving. And if you have not entered into the waters of baptism to receive this reconciliation, to be made right with God, and you are at enmity with God because the blood of Christ has not come upon you through this obedience of baptism, or if you have become disobedient to God in a way that you require the prayers of the saints, we would ask that you would come forward now as we are led in the song of encouragement. Uh -huh. 